the member of the healthcare team that is paired with one of the main functions of this team member. A. Occupational therapist, gait exercises. B. Physical therapist, the provision of assistive devices to facilitate the activities of daily living. C. Speech and language therapist, the treatment of swallowing disorders. D. Case manager, ordering medications and treatments. Correct answer is C. Speech and language therapists assess and treat patients with a swallowing disorder, they also assess and treat patients with speech and communication problems as often occurs after a cerebrovascular accident, or stroke. Occupational therapists assist patients with their activities of daily living and they also provide patients with assistive devices to facilitate eating and dressing. Physical therapists perform rehabilitation and restorative care including help with ambulation and balance slash gait exercises. Lastly, case managers coordinate care along the continuum. The recommended daily caloric intake for sedentary older men, active adult women and children is A. 2,400 calories B. 1,600 calories C. 2,800 calories D. 2,000 calories. Correct answer is D. Sedentary older men, active adult women and children should all have 6 ounces of grains, 2.5 cups of vegetables, 2 cups of fruits, and 3 cups of milk to help make up their 2,000 calorie requirement. Sedentary adolescents require 2,400 calories, sedentary women and children require 1,600 calories and active adolescents need 2,800 calories daily. Ill health, malnutrition, and wasting as a result of chronic disease are all associated with A. Surgical asepsis B. Catabolism C. Cachexia D. Venous stasis Correct answer is C. Ill health, malnutrition, and wasting as a result of chronic disease are all associated with cachexia. Cachexia can also result from dehiscence of a surgical incision or rupture of wound closure. Surgical asepsis refers to using a sterile technique to protect against infection before, during, and after surgery. The breakdown of tissue, especially after severe trauma or crush injuries is known as catabolism. Venous stasis is a disorder related to pooling of blood in a vein of the body. Venous stasis typically occurs in the lower extremities and it is one of the many hazards, or complications, of immobilization. Select all the possible opportunistic infections that adversely affect HIV slash AIDS infected patients. A. Visual losses. B. Kaposi's sarcoma. C. Vilmes's sarcoma. D tuberculosis. E. Peripheral neuropathy. F. Toxoplasma gondii. Correct answer is B. D. F. Kaposi's sarcoma, tuberculosis, toxoplasma gondii, mycobacterium avium, herpes simplex, histoplasmosis and salmonella infections are HIV slash AIDS associated opportunistic infections. Although many affected patients can experience blindness and peripheral neuropathy, these disorders result from impaired nervous system damage rather than an infection. Lastly, Vilmes's tumor is a pediatric form of kidney cancer and it is neither an infection nor something that typically affects the patient with HIV AIDS. What can help reduce a patient's anxiety and post-surgical pain? A. Preoperative teaching B. Preoperative checklist C. Psychological counseling D. Preoperative medication. Correct answer is A. Patient teaching before surgery not only helps to reduce a patient's anxiety and post-surgical pain but it also decreases the amount of anesthesia needed and a lack of anxiety additionally speeds up wound healing. Preoperative checklists are a form of nursing documentation that is used to guide and document the care of the patient before surgery. Psychological counseling is typically not necessary except under highly unusual circumstances and preoperative medication can decrease the amount of anesthetic needed and respiratory tract secretions but it does not help with postoperative pain. Which disease decreases the metabolic rate? A. Cancer B. Hypothyroidism C. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease D. Cardiac failure 
Correct answer is B. Hypothyroidism causes a decreased metabolic demand, so fewer calories are required. Cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or cardiac failure all increase the metabolic demands and the need for added calories. When caring for an infant during cardiac arrest, which pulse must be palpated to determine cardiac function? A. Carotid B. Brachial C. Pedal D. Radial Correct answer is B. The brachial pulse is the most accessible pulse on an infant and, therefore, it is the site of choice. The carotid pulse may be difficult to palpate due to the fatty tissue that typically, and often, surrounds an infant's neck. Lastly, the radial and pedal pulses may not be reliable indicators of cardiac function. The patient should be sitting when deep breathing and coughing because this position A. Is physically more comfortable for the patient B. Helps the patient to support their incision with a pillow C. Loosens respiratory secretions D. Allows the patient to observe their area and relax Correct answer is B. The patient should be sitting when deep breathing and coughing because this position allows the patient to be better able to splint the incision with a pillow which provides abdominal support during coughing. It also allows the lungs to more fully expand because the diaphragm drops. The most comfortable position for the patient is the supine position, however, this position does not permit the lungs to fully expand. There is no association or correlation between loosening respiratory secretions or relaxation with this sitting position which procedures necessitate the use of surgical asepsis techniques. Select all that apply. A. Intramuscular medication administration. B. Central line intravenous medication administration. C. Donning gloves in the operating room. D. Neonatal bathing. E. Foley catheter insertion. F. Emptying a urinary drainage bag. Correct answer is B. C. E. Surgical asepsis is used when managing central line intravenous medication administration, when donning sterile gloves in the operating room and when inserting an indwelling Foley catheter. Medical asepsis, or clean technique, is used when bathing an neonate, when emptying a urinary drainage bag and when administering an intramuscular medication injection. What is the ultimate purpose and goal of performance improvement activities? A. To increase efficiency. B. To contain costs. C. To improve processes. D. To improve policies. Correct answer is C. The ultimate purpose of quality improvement activities is to identify process flaws and then to change the process so that it is fail-proof. Fail-proof processes prevent human error and possible patient harm. Although these process improvements and changes may also increase efficiency and decrease costs, the ultimate goal of quality improvement activities is to prevent future occurrences with process changes and not costs and efficiency. Lastly, it is known that processes, not policies, are the root cause of many medical errors. The primary difference between practical nursing licensure and a nursing certification in an area of practice is that nursing licensure is a ensures competency and a nursing certification validates years of experience b mandated by the american nurses association and a nursing certification are not c is legally mandated by the states and a nursing certification is not d renewed every two years and a nursing certification is renewed every five years correct answer is c the primary difference between practical nursing licensure and a nursing certification in an area of practice is that nursing licensure is legally mandated by the states and not the American Nurses Association and a nursing certification is not mandated. To practice nursing without the current and valid license is contrary to the law. Nursing licenses are renewed every two years and nursing certifications are typically renewed every three years, however, this may vary according to the particular certification. Passing the NCLEX examination and receiving a nursing license indicates that the graduate has at least the minimal competency necessary to provide safe patient care. Nursing certifications, on the other hand, validate expertise in a particular area of nursing practice. What intervention is the best to relieve constipation during pregnancy? A. Increasing the consumption of fruits and vegetables. B. 
taking a mild over-the-counter laxative. C. Lying flat on back when sleeping. D. Reduction of iron intake by half or more. Correct answer is A. Dietary roughage, or fiber, with sufficient fluids and exercise may help relieve constipation. Over-the-counter medications should be avoided during pregnancy. The supine position can place additional pressure on the aorta and vena cava, leading to vena cava syndrome. A reduction of iron supplements during pregnancy may reduce hemoglobin production and result in a less than an effective immune system. You are the LPN working on 2 East with adult medical surgical patients. Your unit has been instructed to perform a horizontal evacuation of your patients because there is a fire on 1 East. Where will you evacuate your patients to? A. 3 West B. 3 East C. 2 West D. 1 West Correct answer is C. You would evacuate your patients to West. A horizontal evacuation is the movement of patients to another area of the same floor. A vertical evacuation is the movement of patients to a different floor or level of the building. Patient evacuations are done to prevent patient injury. Under no circumstances should the elevators be used for evacuations. Which electrolyte is essential for enzyme and neurochemical activities? A. Chloride B. Magnesium C. Potassium D. Phosphate Correct answer is B. Magnesium is essential for enzyme and neurochemical activities and it is also needed for cardiac and skeletal muscle excitability. Chloride is the most abundant negatively charged ion in extracellular fluid with potassium being the most abundant positively charged ion. Phosphate assists in acid-base regulation. Number the choices below to reflect the correct sequence for using a fire extinguisher. A. Aim at the base of the fire. B. Squeeze the handle. C. Sweep back and forth. D. Pull the pin. Correct answer is D. A. B. C. The correct sequence of action for using a fire extinguished is easily remembered by keeping the PASS acronym in mind. P is pulling out the pin to activate the fire extinguisher, A is to aim the fire extinguisher at the base of the fire, S is to squeeze the handle to discharge the contents of the fire extinguisher, and S is sweep back and forth over the base of the fire while discharging the contents. As you are working you suspect that another licensed practical nurse is verbally and physically abusing a patient. What is the first thing that you will do? A. Nothing because you are not certain that it is occurring. B. Nothing because you only suspect the abuse. C. Call the police or the security department. D. Report your suspicions to the charge nurse. Correct answer is D. Nurses and other healthcare providers, are mandated by law to report all suspected abuse and neglect. You do not have to be certain about it, an expert will perform the investigation. You do not contact the police or the security department, the charge nurse will follow established procedures for notifications not the licensed practical nurse. Which of the following is the World Health Organization's WHO, definition of health? A. The absence of all illness and disease. B. The absence of any comorbidities. C. A holistic state of well-being. D. A use of health promotion activities. Correct answer is C. The World Health Organization WHO, defines health as a holistic, holistic, state of well-being. This state of well-being is far more than the absence of illness, diseases and comorbidities. Lastly, the use of health promotion activities does promote health but these activities do not define health according to the World Health Organization. Which nursing theorist believes that most patients are capable of performing self-care? A. Dorothea Oren B. Madeline Leininger C. Martha Rogers D. Sister Callista Roy Correct answer is A. Dorothea Oren developed the self-care theory or model. This theory maintains that some patients are completely compensatory and totally dependent on the nurse for care, other patients are partially compensatory and need only assistance by the nurse and others are totally independent in terms of their self-care needs. Madeline Leininger developed the transcultural nursing theory, 
Martha Rogers developed the science of unitary human beings theory, and Sister Callista Roy developed the adaptation theory of nursing practice. What element is minimally assessed during a basic prenatal physical examination? A. Palpation and auscultation of the abdomen. B. Examination of the anus and rectum. C. Urinalysis for glucose, protein and ketones. D. Visual assessment of cervix and vagina. Correct answer is C. A urinalysis is considered routine during the prenatal examination. Assessment of the cervix, vagina, anus, rectum, and palpation and auscultation of the abdomen may not be checked until a complete gynecologic examination is done by the doctor. A positive over-the-counter pregnancy test is considered a a. Possible sign of pregnancy b. Presumptive sign of pregnancy c. Probable sign of pregnancy d. Positive sign of pregnancy Correct answer is c. A positive pregnancy test and changes in the reproductive organs are both considered probable signs of pregnancy. Presumptive signs include amenorrhea, frequent urination and pigment changes in skin. Determining the estimated day of birth or delivery, EDB or EDD, is considered to be a positive sign of pregnancy. Select all of the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. A. Cool skin. B. Thickened bodily hair. C. Heat intolerance. D. Constipation. E. Insomnia. F. Increased appetite. G. Palpitations. Correct answer is C, E, F, G. The signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism include heat intolerance, increased appetite, palpitations and insomnia among others such as thinning hair, the loss of hair, increased sweating, weight loss, emotional instability and diarrhea. During which phase of the nursing process does data get collected and validated with the patient and or family members by the nurse? A. The implementation phase. B. The assessment phase. C. The evaluation phase. D. The planning phase. Correct answer is B. Subjective, objective, primary and secondary data is collected and validated with the patient and or family members by the nurse during the assessment phase of the nursing process. The implementation phase is the actual care of the patient. The evaluation phase includes the comparison of current data to expected outcomes to determine if the patient has achieved the pre-established goals and the planning phase consists of priority setting and care planning. Which of the following is the best worded expected outcome? A. The nurse will provide for adequate hydration. B. The nurse will ensure that the patient is safe. C. The patient will cough and deep breathe every two hours. D. The patient will value health. Correct answer is C. The patient will cough and deep breathe every two hours is the best worded expected patient outcome. This outcome or goal is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, within a specified time frame, trackable and it should be agreed to by the patient. All expected outcomes are worded in terms of what the patient, not the nurse, will do and it should also be specific and measurable. The patient will value health is not measurable. What is a major difference between a problem-oriented medical record and a source-oriented medical record? A. The problem-oriented medical system has a centralized part of the chart for interdisciplinary progress notes and the source-oriented medical records has separate areas for each profession's progress notes. B. The problem-oriented medical system consists of narrative progress notes and the source-oriented medical record uses SOAP. C. The source-oriented medical system uses charting by exception and the source-oriented medical record system does not. D. The source-oriented medical system has a centralized part of the chart for interdisciplinary progress notes and the problem-oriented medical records has separate areas for each profession's progress notes. Correct answer is A. The problem-oriented medical system has a centralized part of the chart for interdisciplinary SOAP progress notes and the source-oriented medical records has separate areas for each profession's progress notes. Although source-oriented medical records can use SOAP, this is not a defining characteristic and most of these notes are free-formed narrative notes. Charting by exception is a distinctly different medical system than source or problem-oriented medical systems. 
Which of the following are necessary elements of malpractice? Select all that apply. A. A breach of duty. B. An intentional act. C. A non-intentional act. D. Foreseeability. E. Patient harm. F. Causation. Correct answer is A, D, E, F. The necessary elements of malpractice are a duty to the patient, a breach of duty, foreseeability, causation, and patient harm. The breach of duty can be intentional or non-intentional. Select the following fire emergency interventions in correct sequential order. A. Pull the fire alarm. B. Contain the fire. C. Rescue patients in danger. D. Extinguish the fire. Correct answer is C, A, B, D. The RACE acronym is used to prioritize and sequence the steps that must be followed when a fire occurs. R stands for rescue patients, A is pulling the fire alarm, C is to contain the fire by closing doors, etc., and E is extinguishing the fire with a fire extinguisher when possible. After your patient has been told that they have Cushing syndrome, the patient asks you what Cushing syndrome is. How would you respond to this patient's question? A. Cushing's syndrome is a type of irritable bowel syndrome. B. Cushing's syndrome is a disorder of the adrenal gland. C. Cushing's syndrome often occurs among patients who are getting radiation therapy. D. Cushing's syndrome often occurs among patients who are chemotherapy. Correct answer is B. Cushing syndrome is a disorder of the adrenal gland. It results from the chronic hypersecretion of glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex. It is Crohn's disease, not Cushing's syndrome, that is a type of irritable bowel syndrome and, there is no relationship between Cushing's syndrome and radiation or chemotherapy. You are preparing a sterile field for a operating room surgical procedure. When should you stop the preparation of this sterile field? A. When you have placed a sterile item only 1 inch and not 2 inches from the edge of the sterile field. B. When you have completely finished the field, you cannot stop the setup until it is all done. C. When you have accidentally poured a sterile liquid into a container that was on the sterile field. D. When you turn your upper body only away from the field because the surgeon calls your name. Correct answer is D. You must stop the preparation of the sterile field and begin all over again when you have turned your upper body away from the field because sterile technique has been violated and the sterility of the field has been broken even when on turns away from the sterile field even for a second. Sterile items must be placed within 1 inch, not 2 inches from the edge of the sterile field. Lastly, sterile solutions can be poured into sterile containers on a sterile field without breaking the techniques required according to surgical asepsis. Avulsed teeth should be placed in A. Normal saline B. Cold water C. Milk D. Warm water Correct answer is C. Avulsed teeth should be immediately placed in milk. An avulsed tooth is the traumatic loss of a tooth. In addition to placing the tooth in milk, the tooth should only be handled at the crown and not the root of the tooth. These interventions preserve the tooth for reimplantation. You are working in a pediatric unit of the hospital and caring for a six-year-old boy who is hospitalized with cystic fibrosis and respiratory compromise. Which developmental task is the challenge for this boy at his age? A. To cough, deep breathe and improve respiratory status. B. To establish industry and self-confidence. C. To develop autonomy and self-control. D. To develop initiative and a sense of purpose. Correct answer is D. According to Eric Erickson, a developmental psychologist, the preschool child is challenged with initiative, the development of confidence and a sense of purpose. The other age groups along the lifespan and their developmental tasks are listed below. Infant, trust toddler, autonomy, self-control and willpower. School age child, industry, self-confidence and competency. Adolescent, identity formation and a sense of self. Young adult, intimacy, affection and love. Middle-aged adult, generativity, productivity and concern about others. Older adults, ego integrity, wisdom and satisfaction with life.
the embryonic period during pregnancy takes place from a weeks 1 to 12 b weeks 1 to 10 c weeks 3 to 5 d weeks 6 to 10 correct answer is d the embryonic period begins around week 6 following the ovulation period of weeks 1 to 2 and the cell division and implantation period from weeks 3 to 5. The first trimester runs from week 1 until week 12. Place these human needs in order from the greatest priority to the least priority using number 1 as the greatest priority and number 5 as the least of all in terms of priority. A. Self-esteem and esteem by others. B. Self-actualization. C psychological needs d love and belonging e physiological needs correct answer is e c d a b according to abraham maslow the hierarchy of human needs from the most basic and necessary to the least priority are the physiological or biological needs the safety and psychological needs the need for love and belonging self-esteem and the esteem by others and self-actualization Maslow's theory states that until the most basic priority needs are satisfied in a stepwise manner, the less priority needs cannot be addressed and fulfilled. During which week does the fetal heart begin pumping its own blood? A. Third week. B. Fifth week. C. Ninth week. D. Sixth week. Correct answer is A. The embryonic heart begins pumping its own blood often a different blood type than the mother's, during week 3. Week 5 includes the development of eyes, legs, and hands. Brain waves become detectable during week 6 and teeth begin to develop during week 9 of gestation. Which of the following is a vector of infection? A. A contaminated ball. B. A contaminated thermometer. C. An infected person. D. An infectious fly. Correct answer is D. An infectious fly is an example of a vector that can transmit infection. Other vectors, or non-human living beings that can transmit infections to humans, include mice, vermin and mosquitoes. Inanimate items that can spread infection by contact are referred to as fermites. Examples of fermites include a contaminated thermometer, balls and doorknobs. An infected human being is a host according to the chain of infection and not a vector. Which oral disorder appears as yellow or white spots on the oral mucosa that are not possible to scrape off without bleeding? A. Herpes simplex. B. Candidiasis. C. Alphthus ulcers. D. Leukoplakia. Correct answer is B. Oral candidiasis is characterized with yellow or white spots on the oral mucosa that are not possible to scrape off without bleeding, therefore, no attempts to remove these spots should be done. Herpes simplex is marked with tingling and burning of the lips and mouth areas as well as blisters and a sore throat. Alphthus ulcers, or canker sores, a sore or oral lesions, and oral leukoplakia leads to thickened, white patches on the cheeks, tongue, lower lip or on the floor of the mouth. Which type of cancer has the poorest prognosis? A. Squamous cell carcinoma. B. Breast cancer. C. Pancreatic cancer. D. Gastric cancer. Correct answer is C. Of all of the above types of cancer, it is pancreatic cancer that has the poorest prognosis. This is based on the fact that pancreatic cancer is not symptomatic, and therefore, it is diagnosed after the point when a surgical removal can be performed. It is a rapid course and it is characterized with a high degree of mortality. States throughout our nation vary somewhat in terms of things that nursing assistants can and cannot legally do. Which statements about these state-to-state -state differences are accurate? Select all that apply. A. Nursing assistants can change catheter tubings but not catheters. B. Nursing assistants can change sterile dressings. C. Nursing assistants have an expanding role in many states. D. Nursing assistants cannot assess the physical status of the patients. E. Nursing assistants can apply topical medication lotions to intact skin. F. The trend is moving toward nurses-only staffing patterns. Correct answer is C. D. 
nursing assistants have an expanding role in many states. For example, some states permit nursing assistants to take ECGs, or EKGs, and to perform phlebotomy when they are given the necessary training and have been deemed competent to do so. Only nurses assess, nursing assistants cannot assess the physical status of the patients. Nursing assistants cannot perform any sterile procedures. For example, they cannot change catheter tubings and they cannot change sterile dressings. Lastly, nursing assistants do not administer medications. Topical skin lotions that contain a medication is considered a medication, therefore, the nursing assistant cannot apply them. A caesarean mode of delivery, often utilized for various reasons, is the most common mode for females with which pelvic type is a. Android b. Anthropoid c. Gynecoid d. Platyploid Correct answer is a. Android pelvic types are heart-shaped and found among 23% of all women. Gynecoids are round pelvic types and the most common type at about 50%. Oval-shaped pelvic types are anthropoid and found at a rate of 24%. Platyploids are flat and the least common pelvic type at 3%. How many bones make up a newborn skull? A. 8 B. 4 C. 6 D. 5 Correct answer is D. The typical newborn skull will consist of two frontal bones, two parietal bones, and an occipital bone for five total bones. Sutures divide these bones and there are six fontanelles, or soft spots, where the sutures intersect one another. Your patient has just returned from the diagnostic imaging department and the doctor has told the patient that they have a Mallory Weiss tear. The patient asks you what a Mallory Weiss tear is. How should you respond to this patient? A. A Mallory Weiss tear is a kind of diverticulitis. B. A Mallory Weiss tear is an esophageal tear. C. A Mallory Weiss tear is a lacrimal gland disorder. D. A Mallory Weiss tear is a tear that results from a peptic ulcer. Correct answer is B. A Mallory Weiss tear is a linear tear of the esophageal mucosa. Alcohol use and abuse are the most commonly occurring risk factors. These tears are not associated with peptic ulcers or diverticulitis. The lacrimal glands in the eyes produce tears to lubricate the eyes. You have been asked to speak at a new nursing assistance orientation class about infection control and hand washing techniques. What would you include in this teaching? A. Demonstrate the correct one minute hand washing procedure using soap and running water. B. Demonstrate the correct two-minute hand washing procedure using soap and running water. C. Using hot water so that the natural fats on the skins are emulsified with the soap. D. Using cold water so that the natural fats on the skins are emulsified with the soap. Correct answer is B. The best way to teach the techniques of hand washing is to actually demonstrate the correct hand washing procedure. Proper hand washing must be done for a minimum of two minutes. Warm not cold water or hot water is used for hand washing. How many minims are contained in 1 milliliter? A. Between 10 to 11. B. 12. C. 20. D. Between 15 or 16. Correct answer is D. A minimum is 1 by 480 of a fluid ounce or 0.002083333333333. Oz. 1 milliliter equals 0.033814 ounces. Periwound maceration occurs when A. The skin around the wound softens and is damaged. B. Selecting a dressing individualized to the type of wound. C. Negative pressure to air out the wound is used. D. The skin around the wound dries out and hardens. Correct answer is A. Periwound maceration, also classified as moisture-associated skin damage, is the softening of the skin and damaging of connective fibers which leads to the wound drying out and hardening. Dressing selection can help prevent this complication, and negative pressure may reduce it by reducing edema. Which patient is at greatest risk for cholelithiasis and cholecholithiasis? A. A 70-year-old male patient who has liver disease. B. 
a 70-year-old female patient who has liver disease. C. A 50-year-old male patient who is Asian. D. A 50-year-old female patient who is Asian. Correct answer is B. The 70-year-old female patient who has liver disease is at the greatest risk because the female gender, advancing age and the liver disease are known risk factors for cholelithiasis and cholelithiasis. Other risk factors include obesity, oral contraceptive use, diseases and disorders of the ileum, hypercholesterolemia and races like the Hispanic, Native American and Caucasian races. Select the method of special precautions that is accurately paired with the personal protective equipment that is minimally required in order to prevent the spread of infection. A. Contact precautions, gowns, gloves and mask. B. Droplet precautions, face mask. C. Airborne transmission precautions, negative pressure room. D. Contact precautions, gloves. Correct answer is B. The minimal personal protective equipment that is required for droplet precautions is a face mask. Contact precautions minimally require the use of gloves and gowns, and airborne transmission precautions minimally require the use of a negative pressure room, a HEPA mask, gowns and gloves. Which statement about Meniere's disease is accurate and true? A. Meniere's disease most commonly occurs among members of the elderly population. B. Meniere's disease is insidious and it always affects both ears. C. Meniere's disease occurs with an impairment of the second cranial nerve. D. Antiemetic drugs are used for the treatment of patients affected with Meniere's disease. Correct answer is D. Antiemetic drugs as well as other drugs to treat the vertigo, like antivert, as well as diuretics are used for the treatment of patients affected with Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease typically affects only one ear, it is not the result of second cranial nerve damage. Lastly, people in their 40s and 50s are at greater risk for Meniere's disease and not the elderly. Which of these patients is affected with a healthcare required infection? A. A 18 year old male patient who developed an intravenous line infection two days after insertion. B. A 72-year-old male patient who is at risk for infection secondary to AIDS slash HIV. C. A 67-year-old female patient who was admitted with a urinary tract infection. D. A 5-year-old pediatric patient who develops the measles rash three days after admission. Correct answer is A. The 18-year-old male patient who developed an intravenous line infection two days after insertion is affected with a healthcare-related, or nosocomial, infection. These infections include all infections that occur while the patient is receiving healthcare services. The patient who was admitted with a urinary tract infection and the pediatric patient who develops the measles rash three days after admission acquire these infections prior to receiving healthcare services so they are not considered healthcare related, or nosocomial, infections. Lastly, the 72-year-old male patient who is at risk for infection secondary to AIDS slash HIV has not yet been infected, he is simply at risk for infection. The stages of infection in correct sequential order are a. The prodromal, incubation, illness and convalescence stages b. The incubation, prodromal, illness and convalescence stages c. The prodromal, primary, secondary and tertiary stages d. The inflammation, infection and immunity stages Correct answer is a. The incubation prodromal, illness and convalescence stages are the stages of infection in correct sequential order. Inflammation, infection and immunity are commonly used terms in infection control but they are not stages of the infection process. Primary, secondary and tertiary are levels of prevention and not stages of the infection process. What is the single most important thing that nurses do in order to prevent the spread of infection? A. Applying standard precautions b. Using personal protective equipment c. Adhering to the principles of asepsis d. Hand washing Correct answer is d. Hand washing is the single, most important thing that nurses, and other healthcare professionals, can do in order to prevent the spread of infection.
applying standard precautions, using personal protective equipment, as indicated, and adhering to the principles of asepsis also prevent the spread of infections. However, hand washing is the single most important thing to prevent the spread of infection. Rh negative maternal blood indicates a. An incompatibility in the blood between the mother and fetus. b. That antibodies in the mother's blood are attacking her baby's blood. c. The mother will require a blood transfusion at the time of delivery. d. The mother does not have a specific marker on her red blood cells. Correct answer is d. The mother's red blood cells lacking a specific marker indicate that she is Rh negative. However, incompatibility only occurs if the baby is Rh positive and the mother is Rh negative. This is typically not a problem with a first pregnancy, but in a subsequent pregnancy, the incompatibility can cause the antibodies created during the first pregnancy to attack the new fetus red blood cells. A blood transfusion would have no effect on this problem. Congratulations! That conclude our part 1 video for NCLEX practice test. Please like comment, and subscribe on my channel for part 2 of our practice test. Thank you so much. Welcome back for the part 2 of our NCLEX practice test video, most of the questions, are multiple choices questions with 4 items, others are alternative format questions such as choosing all the items where more than one item is correct fill in the blanks and listing priorities or steps in a procedure from the first to the last. You will see all types of questions in our practice examination for licensed practical nurses. Let's get started. Question number 1, low birth weight is defined as a newborn's weight of a. 2,500 grams or less at birth, regardless of gestational age. b. 1,500 grams or less at birth regardless of gestation and age. c. 2,500 grams or less at birth, according to gestation and age. d. 1,500 grams or less at birth, according to gestation and age. Or correct answer is a. Low birth weight, LBW, is considered to be a birth weight of less than 2,500 grams regardless of gestation and age. Very low birth weight, VLBW, is less than 1,500 grams and extremely low birth weight, ELBW, which is less than 1,000 grams. Normal weight for a full-term neonate is 2,500 to 4,200 grams. Question number 2. You are caring for a neonate who has a cleft palate. You should inform the mother that surgical correction will be done when the infant is a. 8 to 12 months of age b 20 to 24 months of age c 16 to 20 months of age d 12 to 16 months of age correct answer is a repairs of cleft palates are typically done before 12 months because this allows for palatal changes associated with normal growth to occur while repairs can still be performed after one year of age but this increases the likelihood of needing longer term treatments and increased risks for poor language development and facial appearance. Question number 3. What percentage of term newborns has a congenital heart disease due to environmental risk factors such as maternal alcoholism or drug ingestion? A 2% to 4% B 10% to 20% C 5% to 10% D 7% to 9% Correct answer is C. It is estimated that 5% to 10% of term newborns are born with a congenital heart disease due to environmental risk factors such as maternal alcoholism or drug ingestion. This rate is higher in infants born prematurely. Other environmental risk factors include intrauterine rubella exposure, diabetes mellitus and advanced maternal age in addition to genetic factors. Question number 4. Who should document care? A. The LPNs should document the care that they provided and the care that was given by unlicensed assistive staff. B. The registered nurse must document all of the care that is provided by the nursing assistants because they are accountable for all care. C. All staff members should document all of the care that they have provided. D. 
all staff should document all of the care that they have provided but the registered nurse, as the only independent practitioner, signs it. Correct answer is C. All staff members, including unlicensed assistive staff like nursing assistants, document and sign all of the care that they have personally provided. For example, the nursing assistants will document the vital signs that they have taken, the licensed practical nurses will document all of the treatments and the medications that they have given to the patient, and the registered nurse will document nursing diagnoses and assessments that they have completed. Question number 5. Your 54-year-old male HIV positive patient has just expired. How should you care for this deceased patient? A. Bathe the patient but it is no longer necessary to use standard precautions because the patient is deceased. B. Place the patient in a negative pressure isolated area of the morgue. C. Double shroud the patient to prevent the spread of infection. D. Bathe the patient using the same standard precautions you used when he was alive. Correct answer is D. You should bathe your patient as part of post-mortem care using the same standard precautions that you did when the patient was alive. The patient is still infectious. Similarly, all patients are bathed after death using standard precautions. Double shrouding and an isolation area in the morgue with negative air pressure are not necessary. Question number 6. Select the types of pain that are accurately coupled with an example of it. Select all that are correct. A. Radicular pain, a broken bone. B. Central neuropathic pain, a spinal cord injury. C. Peripheral neuropathic pain, a fractured leg bone. D. Chronic pain, a stab wound to the chest. E. Nociceptive pain, a laceration. F. Radicular pain, a herniated spinal disc. Correct answer is B. E. F. A spinal cord injury is an example of an injury that leads to central neuropathic pain. The central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. Lacerations and broken, fractured bones are examples of nociceptive pain and a herniated spinal disc can lead to radicular pain. Stab wound can result in acute, not chronic, pain, and peripheral neuropathic pain can result from carpal tunnel syndrome and post-amputation phantom pain. Question number 7. Select the stage of viral hepatitis that is accurately paired with its characteristics. A. The prodromal stage, jaundice begins. B. The icteric stage, flu-like symptoms occur. C. The pre-icteric stage, elevated urine bilobin levels. D. The post-icteric stage, jaundice and dark urine occurs. Correct answer is C. During the pre stage of viral hepatitis, elevated urine bilobin levels, nausea, chills, anorexia, fever and mild upper right quadrant pain occur. The icteric stage is marked with pruritus, clay stools, darkened urine and jaundice. The post stage occurs when a patient returns to near normal physical status. There is no prodromal stage of viral hepatitis. Question number 8. Which nursing diagnosis is the most commonly used among patients who are affected with fibromyalgia? A. Decreased self-care in the activities of daily living related to fatigue. B. Impaired mental functioning related to electrolyte imbalances. C. Increased vigilance secondary to electrolyte imbalances. D. At risk for a swallowing disorder related to fibromyalgia. Correct answer is A. The signs and symptoms of fibromyalgia include widespread aching, muscle stiffness, fatigue and sleep disorders. The degree of fatigue can be so severe that the patient is unable to even perform the activities of daily living. Fibromyalgia, a chronic disorder associated with periods of exacerbation and remission is not associated with a swallowing disorder, hypervigilance, mental functioning alterations or electrolyte imbalances. Question number 9. Alcohol, caffeine, or drugs are higher risk factors that all fall under which broad classification of risk factors? A. Social demographic. B. Environmental. C. Biophysical. D. Psychosocial. Correct answer is D. 
Psychosocial risk factors include lifestyle choices like the use or abuse of alcohol, caffeine and illicit drugs in addition to smoking and psychological status. Low income, age, and ethnicity are social demographic risk factors. Second-hand smoke and air pollution are environmental risk factors, and biophysical risk factors include genetic considerations, nutritional status and disorders such as diabetes. Question number 10. Multifetal pregnancies with triplets occur at a rate of 1 in 8,100 births, but twins occur much more frequently with a rate of a. 1 in 85 births b. 1 in 5,400 births c. 1 in 2,700 births d. 1 in 540 births Correct answer is a. Twins, whether monozygotic or dizygotic, occur at the rate of about 1 in every 85 births. This rate has seen increases due to various reasons, such as the frequency of fertility treatments and women waiting until later in life to have children. Older women, defined as over 35 years old, are more likely to carry multiples than younger women. Question number 11. When a woman has miscarried in three or more consecutive pregnancies, it is referred to as which type of spontaneous abortion? A. Inevitable. B. Missed. C. Habitual. D. Emotional. Correct answer is C. When a woman has miscarried in three or more consecutive pregnancies, it is referred to as habitual abortions. Habitual abortions are often the result of the additional emotional trauma experienced from multiple miscarries. Inevitable abortions are characterizes with bleeding and dilation of the cervical loss. When the fetus dies and growth ends, but remains in utero, it is called a missed abortion. Foul smelling bleeding, fever, and cramping often occur with a septic abortion which is often the result of severe infections. Question number 12. Your long-term care patient has chronic pain and at this point in time the patient needs increasing dosages to adequately control this pain. What is this patient most likely to be affected with? A. Drug addiction. B. Drug interactions. C. Drug side effects. D. Drug tolerance. Correct answer is D. Patients with chronic pain are often affected with drug tolerance. Drug tolerance occurs when a patient needs increasing dosages of analgesic medications to adequately control their pain in order to produce the same effect that was produced when the drug was originally begun. Drug addiction, on the other hand, is a constant and compulsive need for a drug even when the use of the drug causes harm to the person. Addiction can occur with or without physical dependence. The need for increasing dosages is not the result of medication side effects or food slash drug or drug slash drug interactions. Question number 13. The normal sodium level in the body is A. 135 to 145 milliequivalents. B. 3 to 5 milliequivalents. C. 135 to 145 microequivalents. D. 3 to 5 microequivalents. Correct answer is A. The normal sodium level in the body is from 135 to 145 milliequivalents, not from 135 to 145 microequivalents. Question number 14. Which type of practice is most similar to research-based practice? A. Best practices. B. Evidence-based practice. C. Benchmark practices. D. Standard-based practice. Correct answer is B. Evidence-based practice is an approach to patient care that encourages nurses to use the best available evidence, or research, in combination with the individual patient's circumstances and preferences in clinical practice. Simply stated, evidence-based practice is research-based practice. Best practices may or may not be based on sound research, benchmarks are similar to best practices and these benchmarks are used so that nurses can compare their outcomes of care to those of others. Standards of care are guidelines for practice, standards of care and standards of practice are published by the American Nurses Association as well as other professional organizations and associations. 
Question number 15. Select the ethical principles that are paired with their description. Select all that apply. A. Justice, being honest and fair. B. Beneficence, do no harm. C. Veracity, treating all patients equally. D. Self-determination, facilitating patient choices. E. Beneficence, do good. F. Non-maleficence, do no harm. G. Self-determination, accountability. Correct answer is D. E. G. The principle of justice requires us to be fair and just to all. Fidelity is being faithful to one's promises. By the very nature of the implicit nurse-client relationship, the nurse must be faithful and true to their professional promises and responsibilities by providing high-quality, safe care in a competent, scientifically grounded manner while upholding the client's choices, desires and innate rights. Beneficence means doing good, it is more than not doing harm. Non-maleficence is do not harm, as stated in the historical Hippocratic Oath. Patient self-determination and autonomy is the ethical principle that supports the patient's right to make their own choices without coercion or the undue influence of others. Lastly, veracity is truthfulness and being honest with the patients. Question number 16. You are caring for a patient with multiple trauma. Of all of these injuries and conditions, it the most serious? A. A deviated trachea. B. Gross deformity of a lower extremity. C. Hematuria. D. Decreased bowel sounds. Correct answer is A. A deviated trachea is a serious life-threatening condition. A deviated trachea is a symptom of tension pneumothorax which can be life-threatening. All of the other symptoms will need to be addressed and treated, however, it is the deviated trachea that is the most severe and of the greatest priority. Question number 17. Which statement about appendicitis is accurate and true? A. Appendicitis is more common among females than males. B. A high fiber diet is a risk factor associated with appendicitis. C. Left lower quadrant pain is suggestive of appendicitis. D. M.C. Burney's point tenderness is suggestive of appendicitis. Correct answer is D. M.C. Burney's point tenderness in the right lower quadrant is suggestive of appendicitis. Appendicitis is more common among males than females and those with a high carbohydrate and or low fiber diet are at risk for this inflammation and infection. Question number 18. Which skin disorder most closely resembles and mimics stand rough? A. Lice infestation. B. Scabies. C. Dematitis. D. Acne vulgaris. Correct answer is A. Lice infestation with nits most closely resembles and mimics stand rough. Other signs and symptoms of lice infestation include itching and small, red bumps on the scalp, shoulders and or neck. Scabies is characterized with itchiness and thin, irregular mite burrow tracks that appear like tiny blisters or bumps on the skin. Dermatitis is evidenced with an itchy rash on swollen, reddened skin. Acne vulgaris appears as blackheads and or whiteheads, papules, pustules, nodules, and or cysts. Question number 19. You have just learned that another nurse was fired for taking photographs of patients without their permission using a cell phone and posting them on Facebook. This nurse was fired because the nurse has a. Violated the law b. Acted in a negligent manner c. Not completed the proper documentation d. Violated an ethical principle Correct answer is a. This nurse was fired because the nurse has violated a federal law, namely, the U.S. government's Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act HIPAA. This law protects the patient's rights to the privacy and confidentiality of all medical information, including written, oral electronic information, and personal identity information like photograph taking unless the client has expressly consented to it in writing. Negligence is failing to do something in the proper manner, this invasion of patient privacy is far more serious than a breach of an ethical principle. Lastly, photographs and Facebook posting should never be done so proper documentation is not required. It is still illegal documented or not. Question number 20. 
Which of the following differentiates ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease? A. Crohn's disease primarily affects the left colon and rectum and ulcerative colitis most often affects the right colon and distal ilium. B. Crohn's disease presents with shallow ulcerations and ulcerative colitis presents with a cobblestone appearance of the mucosal lining. C. The extent of involvement is non-contiguous and segmented with Crohn's disease and it is contiguous and diffuse with ulcerative colitis. D. Crohn's disease has primarily mucosal involvement and it is transmural with ulcerative colitis. Correct answer is C. The extent of involvement is non-contiguous and segmented with Crohn's disease, and it is contiguous and diffuse with ulcerative colitis. Other differentiating characteristics include. The typical area of intestinal involvement is the left colon and rectum for ulcerative colitis and the right colon and distal ilium with Crohn's disease. The mucosal appearance has a cobblestone appearance with granulomas with Crohn's disease, and it appears edematous with shallow ulcerations and superficial bleeding. The inflammation associated with Crohn's disease is transmural, and it is mostly mucosal among those with ulcerative colitis. Question number 21. Which atrioventricular heart block is also referred to as Mobitz 2? A. Third degree atrioventricular heart block. B. Second degree atrioventricular heart block. C. First degree atrioventricular heart block. D. Complete heart block. Correct answer is A. Third degree atrioventricular heart block is also referred to as Mobitz 2. This type of heart block occurs when the AV node impulses are blocked as they try to reach the ventricles. First degree heart block occurs when the AV node impulse is delayed. Second degree heart block, as referred to as Mobitzai and Wenke Bark, occurs when there are progressive conduction delays through the AV node that alters the PR and QRS intervals. Complete heart block blocks all atrial impulses to the ventricle. Question number 22. Which preventive measure can be employed to decrease the risk of compartment syndrome? A. The administration of a potassium sparing diuretic for heart failure. B. A bivalve cast for a skeletal fracture. C. A cerebral diuretic to decease intracranial pressure after a head injury. D. A chest tube to restore normal intrathoracic pressure after a pneumothorax. Correct answer is B. A bivalve cast, rather than a solid fiberglass or plaster of Paris cast, for a skeletal fracture can prevent limb-threatening compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome results from increased pressure and circulatory constriction because a solid cast does not accommodate post-fracture swelling like a bivalve cast does. Compartment syndrome is not related to heart failure, head injuries or pneumothoraxes. Question number 23. Which patient is at greatest risk for papilledema? A. An elderly patient with cataracts and the macular degeneration. B. A male patient with hypothyroidism. C. An adolescent with a closed head injury. Correct answer is C. Patients, including adolescents, with a closed head injury is at greatest risk for papilledema because closed head injuries lead to an increase in intracranial pressure which leads to papilledema. Hypothyroidism is associated with exophthalmos and there is no relationship or positive correlation of macular degeneration and or cataracts to papilledema. Question number 24. Your patient has been diagnosed with orchitis. What information about this disorder should you inform the patient about? A. This disorder often occurs as the result of a streptococcus. B. This disorder can be symptomatically treated with ice. C. This disorder can be symptomatically treated with heat. D. This disorder is typically treated with surgery. Correct answer is B. The pain associated with orchiditis, an inflammation of the testicles, is symptomatically treated with the application of ice, not heat, to the groin area. It is not treated with surgery. This infection most often occurs as the result of mumps, the paramyxovirus and some sexually transmitted diseases, not streptococcus. Question number 25. 
which of the following healthcare providers can legally have access to all, or part, of a patient's medical record because they have a need to know. Select all that apply. A. Student nurses caring for a particular patient. B. Registered nurses when they are not caring for a particular patient. C. The vice president for nursing who is investigating a patient for. D. Licensed practical nurses caring for a particular patient. E. A quality assurance nurse collecting data for a performance improvement activity. Correct answer is A, C, D, E. Medical records are restricted to only those who have a need to know. Student nurses caring for a particular patient have the need to know so they can properly care for their patient assignment. The vice president for nursing, as an administrator, who is investigating a patient fall also has a need to know because they are collecting data and information to prevent future falls. Licensed practical nurses caring for a particular patient have the need to know so they can provide care to the patient, and the quality assurance nurse has the need to know because they are collecting data for a performance improvement activity. No nurse, including registered nurses, are allowed access to all or part of a patient's medical record unless they have a need to know because they are providing either direct or indirect care to the patient. Question number 26. Which cardiac arrhythmia can be either acquired or congenital and can spontaneously disappear on its own or lead to ventricular fibrillation? A. Wanky bark. B. Premature arterial contractions. C. Torsada pant. D. Premature ventricular contractions. Correct answer is C. Torsada pant, a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, can be either congenital or acquired, at times, it can spontaneously terminate but it frequently leads to ventricular fibrillation. In some cases cardiac death can occur with the first episode. All of the other cardiac arrhythmias, or dysrhythmias, are acquired and not congenital. Question number 27. Which quality assurance or performance improvement technique is used to identify underlying process flaws? A. Small group process. B. Root cause analysis. C. People at fault process. D. Cause and effect. Correct answer is B. Root cause analysis is a quality assurance or performance improvement technique that is used to identify the underlying root causes of a problem. Root cause analysis focuses on process flaws and not on people who have a or made a mistake. A cause and effect diagram may be used for root cause analysis but it, in itself, is not a quality assurance or performance improvement technique. Although small groups participate in quality assurance or performance improvement activities, small groups are not a quality assurance or performance improvement technique. Question number 28. Which legal document will most likely contain the patient's decision to not get cardiopulmonary resuscitation? A. Healthcare surrogacy. B. Healthcare proxy. C. Advanced directives. D. Durable power of attorney. Correct answer is C. Advanced medical care directives, also referred to as living wills, contain the wishes of the client in terms of treatments and interventions that they do and do not want carried out when they are no longer able to competently provide these consents and rejections of treatment. These legal documents typically include choices relating to cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, mechanical ventilation, intravenous solution administration, life support measures and tube feedings. A durable power of attorney for health care, also referred to as a healthcare surrogate or healthcare proxy, is a legally appointed person who will make decisions relating to health care when the client is no longer competent and able to give legal, informed consent. Question number 29. Select the stage of a pressure ulcer that is accurately pair with its characteristics. A. Stage I, only slight blanching when pressure is applied to the skin. B. Stage 2, the epidermis and part of the dermis is damaged or lost. C. Stage 3, the wound has slough and descar. D. Stage 4, the loss or skin usually exposes some fat. Correct answer is B. A stage 2 pressure ulcer damages the epidermis and part of the dermis. A stage I pressure ulcer remains intact and the skin doesn't briefly lighten or blanch when touched. 
A stage 3 pressure ulcer is a deep wound that can expose some fat, and a stage 4 pressure ulcer exposes bone, muscle and tendons. It is also characterized with slough and descar. Question number 30. You have been assigned to care for a neonate who has been diagnosed with a tetralogy of Fallot. The mother asks you what the tetralogy of Fallot is. How should you respond to this mother? A. The tetralogy of Fallot is a congenital gastrointestinal disorder. B. The tetralogy of Fallot is a congenital cardiac disorder. C. The tetralogy of Fallot will affect the baby's reflexes. D. The tetralogy of Fallot will affect the baby's ability to breastfeed. Correct answer is B. The tetralogy of Fallot is a congenital cardiac disorder that is classified as a cyanotic, rather than a cyanotic, congenital heart disorder that is characterized with abnormal cardiac anomalies. There is no relationship between the tetralogy of Fallot and reflexes or breastfeeding. Question number 31. The protrusion of an internal organ through a wound or surgical incision is referred to as A. Serosanguineus B. Dehiscence C. Evisceration D. Exuded Correct answer is C. Evisceration, or the protrusion of an organ through a wound, most often occurs in the abdominal wall. Serosanguineus describes the thin, red exudate produced by a surgical wound and dehiscence is the separation of a surgical incision. Exuded is another name for discharged in reference to the exudate. Question number 32. Which pain assessment scale is used exclusively for infants and neonates from 32 weeks of gestation to 6 months of age? A. The PEPS pain scale. B. The flak pain scale. C. The faces pain scale. D. The cries pain scale. Correct answer is D. The cries pain scale is used exclusively for infants and neonates from 32 weeks of gestation to 6 months of age. This scale has 5 behavioral measurements that are scored from 0 to 2. The behavioral measurements include the infant's crying, requirements for increased oxygen, increased vital signs, expression, and sleepiness. The PEPS pain scale, preverbal, early verbal pediatric pain scale is used to assess and measure pain among toddlers. The face, legs, activity, crying, consolability scale, flak is used for infants over two months of age and children up to three years of age. The faces pain scale contains cartoon-like pictures of six faces ranging from zero, or no hurt to ten which represents the worst hurt. It is used for pediatric patients who are three years of age and older. Yeah. Question number 33. Which of the following is a hazard of immobility? A. Loss of bone calcium. B. Increased vital capacity. C. Venous vasoconstriction. D. A positive nitrogen balance. Correct answer is A. One of the hazards of immobility is the loss of calcium from the bones that results from non-weight bearing by the immobilized patient. Other complications, or hazards, of immobility include muscle weakness, muscular atrophy, contractures, disuse osteoporosis, hypostatic pneumonia, pooled respiratory secretions, atelectasis, decreased respiratory movement, decreased, not increased, vital capacity, shallow respirations, diminished cardiac reserve, orthostatic hypotension, venous stasis, venous vasodilation, not vasoconstriction. Embly, dependent edema, stiff and painful joints, thrombophlebitis, urinary stasis, renal stones, urinary retention, urinary incontinence, urinary tract infections, pressure ulcers, diminished metabolic rate, a negative, not positive, nitrogen balance, a negative calcium balance, constipation and depression. Question number 34. How many daily feedings are considered normal for a newborn? A. 8 to 10. B. 10 to 12. C. 6 to 8. D. 12 to 14. Correct answer is B. An average newborn stomach empties every 1.5 hours, so common feeding times occur about every 2 hours during a 24-hour period, therefore, 10 to 12 feedings per day is typical. 
frequent breastfeeds increase a mother's prolactin levels, and high prolactin levels are required to establish an adequate milk supply. A higher frequency of feedings help babies compensate for the lower caloric density of the milk. Question number 35. The hormone produces mother's milk is A. Progesterone B. Estrogen C. Prolactin D. Colostrum Correct answer is C. Prolactin is a protein that is best known for its role in enabling females to produce milk, but it also has other functions, such as regulating the immune system. Progesterone has many roles relating to the development of the fetus during pregnancy. Estrogens are best known for their importance in both menstrual and estrous reproductive cycles. Colostrum is the most nutrient-dense part of breast milk produced during the postpartum stage. Question number 36. Which of the following is a life-threatening acute complication of diabetes mellitus? A. Neuropathy B. Hypoglycemia C. Retinopathy D. Impaired microcirculation Correct answer is B. Hypoglycemia is an acute complication of diabetes which can be life-threatening. The immediate treatment with glucose is necessary to preserve life. Retinopathy, neuropathy and impaired microcirculation are examples of the long-term, rather than acute, complications of diabetes. Question number 37. Sutures and staples are typically removed following surgery within a. 7 to 10 days if healing is considered adequate. b. 10 to 14 days if healing is considered adequate. c. 7 to 10 days if no further dressings are needed. d. 10 to 14 days if no further dressings are needed. Correct answer is A. Sutures and staples can be removed within 7 to 10 days if healing has been sufficient and while this removal tends to reduce the amount of dressing supplies needed after removal, a light dressing may still be necessary. Question number 38. Which of these breath sounds is considered normal and not adventitious? A. Vesicular breath sounds B. Fine rails C. Ronchi D. Wheezes Correct answer is A. Vesicular breath sounds are normal breath sounds. Rails, fine and coarse, ronchi and wheezes are all abnormal, adventitious breath sounds. Question number 39. Which type of burn leads to the greatest degree of pain? A. A first degree burn. B. A second degree burn. C. A third degree burn. D. A fourth degree burn. Correct answer is B. Although the first degree burn can cause pain, it is the second degree burn that is the most painful of all. There is a lack of pain with third and fourth degree burns because these burns have destroyed pain sensory nerves. Question number 40. Babies should double their birth weight by their A. 5th to 6th month B. 3rd to 4th month C. 4th to 5th month D. 5th to 7th month. Correct answer is C. Most babies should have doubled their birth weight by 6 months, but many may have doubled their birth weight by 5 months of age. Newborns gain about 5 to 7 ounces per week for the first 3 to 4 months of life. By their first birthday, many babies have tripled their birth weight. Question number 41. Which of the following is best for a client who has difficulty swallowing and chokes frequently? A. A liquid diet. B. Tilting the head back when swallowing. C. Tucking the chin in when swallowing. D. Following each bite with a drink of water. Correct answer is C. The client should tuck the chin when swallowing rather than tilting the head back. Thin fluids and liquids, like water, are thick and prior to drinking to prevent choking. Tilting the head back is dangerous. Question number 42. How long can women lactate for? A. Indefinitely. B. 12 to 18 months. C. 18 to 24 months. D. 30 to 36 months. Correct answer is A. A woman can lactate indefinitely, 
however, it puts them at risk of developing osteoporosis due to the calcium depletion from the bones and teeth. Letting the baby wean itself is ideal. Ideally, all babies should be exclusively breastfed for six months with the gradual introduction of solid foods while continuing to breastfeed. Most women in the United States stop breastfeeding following the 12th month of life. Question number 43. Which anatomic malformations are associated with the tetralogy of Fallot? A. A subaortic septal defect, an overriding aorta, left ventricular hypertrophy, and right ventricular outflow. B. A subaortic septal defect, an overriding aorta, right ventricular hypertrophy, and left ventricular outflow. C. A subaortic septal defect, an overriding aorta, pulmonary atresia, and right ventricular outflow. D. A subaortic septal defect, an overriding aorta, right ventricular hypertrophy, and right ventricular outflow. Correct answer is D. The tetralogy of Philo consists of a subaortic septal defect, an overriding aorta, right, not left, ventricular hypertrophy, and right, not left, ventricular outflow. Pulmonary atresia is not one of the anatomical malformations included in the tetralogy of Fallot. Question number 44. Your 32-year-old female patient has erythema marginatum, sydenham chorea, epistaxis, abdominal pain, fever, cardiac problems and skin nodules. What disorder would you most likely suspect based on these signs and symptoms? A. Leukemia B. Histoplasmosis C. Pneumocystis gyrovec D. Rheumatoid arthritis Correct answer is D. Erythema marginatum, sydenham chorea, epistaxis, abdominal pain, fever, cardiac problems and skin nodules are the signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. Some of the signs and symptoms of leukemia are fever, bleeding and bruising, shortness of breath, loss of appetite, pain in the bones or stomach and painless lumps in the neck, groin and or underarm. Histoplasmosis, a fungal infection, is characterized with fever, chills, cough, chest pain, joint pain, mouth sores and erythema modicum. Lastly, the signs and symptoms of pneumocystis gyrovec, among others, can include fever, shortness of breath, rapid breathing and a dry cough. Question number 45. Select the cranial nerve that is accurately paired with its name. A. The first cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve. B. The twelfth cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve. C. The tenth cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve. D. The thirteenth cranial nerve, the auditory nerve. Correct answer is B. The twelfth cranial nerve is the hypoglossal nerve. This nerve controls and provides motor innovation to the tongue muscles. The other 11 of the 12 cranial nerves and their functions are listed below. A. Olfactory nerve, transmits the sense of smell. B. Optic nerve, transmits visual signals from the retina of the eye to the brain. C. Oculomotor nerve, controls most eye movements. D. Trochlear nerve, moves the eyeballs. E. Trigeminal nerve, innervates the chewing muscles. F. Abducens nerve, eye abduction. G. Facial nerve, controls facial expressions, the lacrimal glands, the salivary glands and other muscles. H. Acoustic nerve, gravity, sound and rotation sensations. I. Glossopharyngeal nerve, senses taste. J. Vagus nerve, it innervates the laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles and controls voice resonance and swallowing. K. Spinal accessory nerve, it innervates the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles. Question number 46. What is the name of the section marked? A. Left ventricle. B. Right ventricle. C. Left atrium. D. Right atrium. E. Coronary artery. F. Pulmonary artery. Correct answer is F. Pulmonary artery. Question number 47. The doctor has ordered 500 milligrams of a medication PO once a day. 
The tablets on hand are labeled as one tablet equals 250 milligrams. How many tablets will you administer to your patient? A. One tablet. B. Two tablets. C. Three tablets. D. Four tablets. Correct answer is B. This problem is set up and calculated as shown below. Question number 48. Which patient is exercising their right to autonomy in the context of patient rights? A. An 86-year-old female who remains independent in terms of the activities of daily living. B. An unemancipated 16-year-old who chooses to not have an intravenous line. C. A 32-year-old who does not need the help of a nurse to bathe and groom themselves. D. A 99-year-old who wants CPR despite the fact that the nurse and doctor do not think that it would be successful. Correct answer is D. The 99-year-old who wants CPR despite the fact that the nurse and doctor do not think that it would be successful is exercising their right to autonomy. Autonomy means that all competent clients have the right to make their own decisions without any coercion or interference even if any or all of their healthcare providers do not agree with this decision. Autonomy is self-determination, and, in the context of the activities of daily living, autonomy is not related to independence, but only independence in terms of decision-making. Lastly, informed legal consents and refusals for treatments, like an intravenous line, is reserved only for those who are not minors and minors who have been emancipated. Question number 49. The mnemonic perla is useful for the assessment of the eyes. What does PERLA stand for? A. Pupils equally reactive to light and accommodation. B. Patient eyes are equally recessed and responsive to light and acuity. C. Patient eyes are equally responsive to light and acuity. D. Pupils equally reactive to light and acuity. Correct answer is A. The mnemonic PERLA stands for pupils equally reactive to light and accommodation, not acuity. Visual acuity is tested with the Snellen chart among adult patients. Question number 50. You are performing a neurological assessment of your adolescent patient. The patient has the Moro reflex. How should you interpret this neurological assessment finding? A. It is normal among adolescents. B. It indicates that the patient has an intact peripheral nervous system. C. It indicates that the patient has an intact central nervous system. D. It is not a normal finding. Correct answer is D. The Moro reflex is a primitive, childhood reflex that disappears long before adolescence and at about three months after birth. The Moro reflex is also referred to as the startle reflex. Other primitive, infant reflexes are the sucking, rooting, step, tonic neck, gallant, 